From the first writings of man with the epic of Adrihasis, to the Hindu knowledge of the Yuga cycles, from the story of Noah to the teachings of Plato, and what the Greeks marking these cycles called the Great Year, there is one common theme that all these ancient writers felt the need to mention, and that's the story of catastrophe. And with these stories separated by distance and time, there is one constant theme. This is a cycle. Though this subject has been glanced at, mocked, and whistled past by modern academia, there is an ever-expanding body of evidence that proves the existence of these cycles in geologic data. From ice cores and volcanic records, to meteor impacts and magnetic anomalies. Not only has the body of evidence been growing from a geologic standpoint, but we are now, just now, able to understand the whys and hows of this cycle on the level of physics and astrophysics. Perhaps this knowledge was something that our ancestors didn't know, didn't widely accept, or simply did not act on in time to prepare. That was their time. This is ours. And we cannot fail future generations. Not for the fear that they will look back upon us unfavorably for not doing more, but for the horrifyingly real possibility that there could be no one left to look back at all. Once you see it, it's difficult to unsee. This cycle in astrophysics is potentially one of the easiest things to understand when you observe the galaxy in which we reside. You see, just like the Earth has a north and south magnetic field, so too does our galaxy. It is in these fields that our solar system treks through on a roughly 25,000 year journey through the totality of both fields, 12,500 years on the southern field and 12,500 on the northern, give or take several hundred years based on the amplitude of that magnetic wave section in the galaxy. Seems straightforward enough, right? So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the smallest portion of the journey, where we cross between the north and south magnetic fields through the accretion disk of the Milky Way itself. Though it only represents a 3% region of space on our crossing, it's where the magnetic mixing of the north and south magnetic fields create the most powerful energies known to man. Where magnetic mixing can excite not only our sun to eject plasma, but also heats every planet in our solar system, including the Earth. You've probably heard it said in jest that we're on a rock hurling through space. That's not quite accurate, but what is a fitting description is that we're on a ferromagnet hurling through space. The mass of the Earth is over half ferromagnetic material, meaning it has a high susceptibility to external magnetic fields. That being the case, it lends itself to many benefits for life on the planet. In fact, we wouldn't be here without it. However, this is a dual-edged, iron-nickel sword, so to speak. It also means that we are extremely vulnerable to the forces of magnetism at play while crossing that 3% region of the accretion disk in the Milky Way. Anyone who has experimented with large magnets and their fields is fully aware they are not to be trifled with. And that force has a myriad of uses. It's the fluid force of magnetism that runs every electric motor on Earth. It's the power of magnetism that can allow us to cook food in a microwave or melt steel in seconds. Though you might not be aware, the power of magnetism is even used to produce the highest energy particles humans have ever experimented with on Earth, high energy X-rays and gamma rays. These are both produced by sending electrons through a slight shift between a north and south magnetic field in a device called an undulator. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN uses such devices to power high energy experiments for the largest machines on Earth. It is this same kind of magnetic mixing we will experience in the crossing of that galactic equator's northern and southern fields. But the scale of the field is so many orders of magnitude larger than that of our earthly experiments. When we look at the Milky Way, 
we're looking at a magnetic field that it takes us 250 million years to circle. In fact, if you look at that 3% region of space where we will be traveling through and follow it back to the central object in our Milky Way, you're looking at the region of space where stars are continuously being formed. As Hindu sage Swami Shiwarteshwarji eloquently phrased it in his writings about the 25,000 year yuga cycle back in the 1800s, it's the field of Brahma. Translated into English, it's the field of creation itself. You've heard it said that seeing is believing. Well, I want you to hear to understand this. What you're about to see and hear is an excerpt from a lecture by Walter Lewin on ferromagnetic materials, specifically where he's demonstrating the Barkhausen effect. This experiment allows you to hear the magnetic domains flip inside a ferromagnetic material. Now I come in very Go bloop, 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 bloop. As you heard the hiss from that ferromagnetic material, he was actually inducing a spin of the ferromagnetic materials inside the crystal lattice of the metal. The magnetic domains are actually pinned between other iron atoms and impurities in the crystal matrix. As those atoms begin to spin, they create friction and release energy during the process. That's what you heard. And if you were to continue that spinning, soon that chunk of metal would begin to heat in direct relation to the speed and field strength acted upon the material. Simple induction. This is where things really begin to heat up, so to speak. You remember that 3% region of space we'll be going through? That region where the largest magnetic fields in our galaxy are mixing? Well, they aren't just mixing a little. They are mixing as two gigantic counter-rotating masses would mix. And that's to say, with an enormous amount of turbulence in the form of magnetic eddies or other magnetic vortices. This has been widely accepted in the astrophysics community for some time. But what astrophysicists fail to realize are the implications such magnetic vortices spell for our entire solar system. I mentioned earlier how a slight bending is used in undulators in order to produce high energy X-rays and gamma rays. When those same undulators are used to create not just a slight bend in the magnetic field, but a full swirling eddy of magnetism, it destroys the equipment, bursting forth with high energy rays and overheating to ultimate failure. Here is a simulation of eddy currents from two counter-rotating masses. You'll notice the intensity of the swirling during the mix. Now just think back to the Barkhausen effect and how those magnetic vortices will spin the magnetic domains of most of the mass in the Earth and thus heat the majority of the material on the very ground upon which we stand. This heating through those magnetic eddies isn't something we'll be experiencing for a few weeks or a few months. No, this trip through the 3% region of space will last our entire solar system 200 years. That's 200 years of not only heating our planet, but our star as well. Not to mention the high energy X-rays and gamma emissions during this period. You see, any material that can emit in a certain spectrum can also receive in said spectrum. This means our sun will not only be exposed to the magnetic heating effects, but will increasingly absorb high energy X-rays and gamma rays that will release in bursts proportional to the influx of energy it receives. The implications for the systems of the Earth are truly staggering. The climate system would not only heat at an accelerated rate, but would give rise to massive oscillation changes in the jet stream, accompanied by weather events the likes of which people haven't seen 
since the days of Noah. While weather seems like it would be the worst of it, I regretfully inform you the far greater threat lies beneath us. You only have to look at the fall of the Roman Empire to realize what a threat volcanoes pose to all life on Earth. What's that? The fall of Rome and volcanoes? Oh yes, ice core samples have proven that a series of massive volcanic eruptions occurred in the 530s and 540s that led to 150 years of cooling temperatures, crop failure, famine, and then the plague of Justinian, which put the final nail in the coffin of the Roman Empire. But that was just recent history. What about the Great Cycle? Oddly enough, you don't have to travel very far from where modern Rome is today to see the last event from our magnetic crossing. And it's an event that wiped the Clovis culture and many other species from North America. In a volcanic field called Campi Felgeri, where 12,000 years ago a supervolcano exploded, spewing an enormous amount of material into the air that shrouded the earth in a volcanic winter, destroying growing conditions in the upper latitudes for a hundred years or more. In addition to the energetic environment, we will be traversing as we cross the galactic equator of the accretion disk, debris fields of meteors riddle these magnetic eddies, swirling in darkness, waiting for large bodies to slam into. This too occurred exactly 12,000 years ago in what is modern Canada. In fact, you could say that it also contributed to the destruction of the Clovis culture. That was but one half a great year ago, and the culture that once ruled all of North America, along with mammoths and mastodons, are no more. You might think it's but a coincidence that it would line up with the accretion disk crossing, but it isn't just that volcano. Exactly one great year ago, the Topo supervolcano in New Zealand erupted, causing another volcanic winter with epic loss of plant and animal life. Holding to the fact that these great years can be as short as 24,000 years to as long as 26,000 years, depending on the region of the accretion disk's amplitude we cross, we are now taken back again to Campi Felgeri volcano off of what is modern Italy, where that supervolcano went off exactly 35,000 years ago, a great year and a half, coinciding with the crossing of the magnetic boundary, this was also the same volcano that wiped out the Neanderthals eight great years ago exactly. It should be remembered that the Earth wouldn't necessarily have a supervolcanic event every time. As we don't find major land eruptions for the 48,000 to 52,000 year range. This, however, doesn't exclude the possibility of an underwater volcano of epic size erupting and being lost to a sea change over time. One thing that definitely wasn't lost to a sea change is the Canyon Diablo Meteorites Crater. Called Meteorite Crater, it is the most preserved meteor impact site on Earth, and it occurred exactly two great years ago. That's right, it lines up perfectly at 50,000 years to the point of impact. And though this is beginning to sound like a broken record, massive impact or volcano, dust blocking out the sun, cold, famine, death. I've visited this site many times near Flagstaff, Arizona, and to stand at the edge looking across truly shows you the enormity of forces at play in the universe. Nothing more than a pebble or a grain of sand in the cosmic scale, but able to alter the direction of entire worlds, wiping out some species completely and allowing others to rise and thrive. In this journey through the Great Years Cataclysms, I would be remiss not to mention the king of all recent cyclical destructions, 
one that is easily the greatest threat humankind has ever faced. And it happened exactly three great years ago with the eruption of Mount Toba 75,000 years ago. The event was so violent and so much matter was ejected from that supervolcano that the world was plunged into a volcanic winter, the likes of which almost entirely ended human life on Earth. From genetic research, scientists have concluded that human life on Earth was reduced to seven to 10,000 people. You heard that right. In very recent geologic history, all human life on Earth was nearly extinguished. And the fact that it fell directly on the cycle of a magnetic crossing is no mere coincidence. With the knowledge we've gained in our understanding of high energy physics and magnetism, we now understand the forces that charged that eruption. This is the threat of threats we as humankind face. The war and madness of men are laughably weak in comparison to the forces of the universe. All the atomic weapons in the world are but a fraction of a blip in comparison to the force of a single supervolcano. In fact, the calculation often presented is that a super eruption equals the force of 1,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs exploding every second. Alas, there's no getting around it. This is the threat we must live with and prepare for.